The hardest thing about learning chess for me and getting better as a player is learning how to get better in the middle game. And that's why I'm reading this book, Improve Your Chess Pattern Recognition, which helps you identify key moves and motifs in the middle game and has helped me tremendously on getting better in my middle game theory. So today, what are we gonna be going over is the Killer Knight. And the Killer Knight is described as a knight on F5 if you're white and F4 if you're black against the Castled King that helps bring other pieces to the king side and create an attack that helps you win your game. So in our first game here, we're looking at our Grandmaster Alexander Jabods versus Ludwig Stonecker. And that is started with a Italian game opening we get into the opening and you know the typical opening moves and then it kind of transposes into a Rui Lopez and they're attacking on the queen side and at this moment a4 happens bishop comes over here to b7 which seems like a normal developing move but what happens when this bishop comes over here to b7 is it's relinquishing control of this f5 square here so after that knight comes over here to g3 which is a very common move you see in the italian is this double knight kind of trio on the f3 and g3 squares after queen comes to c7 he gets the knight here attacking the bishop and at this point it's time to bring in the other pieces into the attack so after the bishop comes over here to f8 the bishop comes over here to attack this knight he comes over to d7 and we get this knight out here to bring the queen into the game after h6 the bishop comes back the king moves over here to h7 and we get queen f3 here. Now at this point, black comes to get rid of this killer knight, but it, it's just too late at this point because bishop to b3 attacking this piece here. And then after that move, there's the knight sack over here on h6 opening up the rest of the kingside attack. You take here, the queen gets in the game. Things aren't looking great. So after the bishop takes there, queen with the check there, bishop comes back and then the bishop to h6 here. If the queen takes here, as he does, rook to e3, bringing this attack over. The knight tries to come in to help with the attack, but the rook is here on h3. After the knight comes here, you push over here on g5, bishop retreats, you bring the other knight into the game, and now you're looking at threatening mate on g5 and all is lost for black. And that really all started with knight to f5 here, taking up so much space on the king side and restricting a lot of movement. And because it's bowied by this pawn, it's super strong. So this is a motif that you definitely should know when you're playing either the Rui Lopez or the Italian games, because this F5 square is a big part of those plans for you. So in our second game here, we're looking at a game between Merrick, Hawelko, and Jusipal. And this is also characterized by an Italian game. And this is gonna be a Pianissima variation, as we can see here. Very, very standard Italian game kind of stuff. He gets the knight over here, looking to get the knights into the game, looking to get it on the f5 square. And after going knight to h5 here, the knight, the black knight is now shooting for f4. So in the king's Indian defense structure against the castled king, f4 is available for you as well when you're black. So knight to f1 here, the queen comes to fight, the bishop comes over to here to e3, and black offers a trade of bishops over here on e6. They trade, bishop takes on a7. So the bishops are off the board. All that remains are the knights. It's looking like for here, the knight on f5 is not available. Black has the really strong knight over here on f4. So after some shuffling of the rooks, black gets its knight over here on f4. White brings his king over here to h2. They're just positioning their pieces even better. But black is just controlling so much of this of this center here that it's restricting a lot of white's, white's piece movement, basically. And so after the, the center is blocked up, black has a much better structure. They have the they have the center on lock and that annoying killer knight is still on F4. Black ended up winning this game and it was all due to the start of this knight here on F4 that just covers so much space. So in our third game here, we have a game between Piquet versus Gurevich and white plays a queen's gambit and black plays the Dutch defense here. And so in the Dutch defense, you can also see that the killer knight can be used in this opening as well. And so after white takes some space, the knight comes over here to a5, he's shuffling all that fun stuff in the opening. And so what we're seeing here is right here on f4, punching the center, trying to break up white's castle structure. And what that also does is one, it makes the structure worse for white, but also opens up f4 for a knight in the future. So the bishop comes over here to f5, white attacks with e4, and the bishop to e6. And so now f4 is completely undefended and is a great spot for the knight to come in here. So after knight to e2, the trade off the knights, the knight comes over here in h5, looking to take that coveted h4 spot. And now it's there, guarded by this rook here. Queen to c2 happens, there's a trade of pieces, and white comes in for the attack here. After trading off the piece there, you just 
have so much attacking possibility that's, a, that's happening for, for Black that after the Queen gets here, you can see by the eval of it, engine, Black is up seven and a half points, and it's a lot of that is due to how much space the Killer Knight takes. It works in the middle game, it works in like when there's a lot of pieces still on the board. This is such a strong knight that you should be including into your repertoire. So in those three examples, we looked at what a Killer Knight is and how you best can use it in your middle game to get an advantage over your opponent. In this last game here, we're gonna be looking at what happens when that Killer Knight is trade off for a bishop, what you should do with your pawn structure. And this usually happens when the bishop is still on the board and white or black will sacrifice their bishop for that Killer Knight because they know how strong that knight is. And the good chess principles move would be to take towards the center. But when you have a castled king and that Killer Knight's taken off the board, sometimes it's best to take towards the sideline towards the king's, the castled king, and that makes it so that you have more of attacking possibilities with the pawn storm on the king's side, as we'll see here. So e4, we get a, a pierce defense here, where white's taking up a lot of space with their pawns. f5 is definitely there for the taking, so is f4 here, but we're looking at white here uh, as they take the advantage. They trade off the, the bishops, white wants to trade off the queens, we get a castle king side, and we're finally getting this knight in the game that's gonna end up becoming our killer knight. White pushes black's knight back. We get the knight here. And after attacking the bishop, we drop back. And after some shuffling of the rooks, we get knight to e8. And that allows white to get their knight over here on f5. This killer knight is set. And black takes with bishop at f5. And what we wanna do in this position, especially with like this kind of pawn structure here, is to push towards the king side. And so now you're gonna have a barreling of pawns going towards this king side with your pieces. It's gonna be a much easier attack for you as we'll see here. So after the queen comes here, try to stop this, this pawn storm. White just simply goes g4 to g5 here. The queen takes the pawn over here on c4. The rook comes over here attacking the queen. After that move there, the bishop just takes. Queen comes back and now this queen is kind of out of the game because this knight, this knight covers this one pawn and it's now away from the king not able to protect it. And with the thrust up here, black is trying to create some counterplay, but it's a little too late in this time because after the bishop takes, the king takes, the rook comes in, and now we're bringing more of the heavy pieces over. The queen comes over here to c8, and now as pieces, the pieces are just rolling over onto the king side, the queen's being attacked, and we have a nice solid checkmate threat here. We have to check on d6, the queen comes here, we need, the, we need the queen over here on h6 or h7, and there's a mating possibility here, and that is knight to f5 attacking this king. The king ha the queen has to take, or else it's checkmate. So after the take there, the queen takes on h6, and that's checkmate. And that's all made possible by this killer knight here, and when the bishop takes, taking with that e pawn and creating a strong pawn storm force that black was unable to defend. So I hope you enjoyed that short lesson on what the Killer Knight is and how you best can use it in your middle game. Remember, it's mostly used in the Italian and Rui Lopez openings, and it has helped immensely with my middle game strategy in those openings. In our next video, we're gonna be going over the center back knight and how you best can employ it. That video will be here, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.